This is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind at Think Tech Hawaii. And we are so pleased today to be discussing uh, some of the commonalities between educational reform and prison reform. And I am extremely grateful because I consider him an old friend um, to have with us Professor Gerard Robinson, who is a professor of practice at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. And so the first question I'm going to ask you, Gerard, first of all, aloha from Hawaii, because I know you're back east in Virginia. And um, the first question I have for you is, tell us about your current position, first of all, because, you know, I know nothing about this. And I've, you know, you know traced your history for most of my, uh, for most of, uh, you know, uh, our years since we met in Washington, D.C. And so uh, tell us about your new position. Aloha. Good to see you. And uh, it's good when you say, you know, Gerard is an old friend. I have a birthday next month, so I'll be older friend. Uh, for you. <laughs> so I'm a, a professor of practice at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy. Uh, about a year ago, uh, the dean of the um, school for Frank Batten School, as well as the dean for the law school, uh, said, you know, we have a position that's open, it's full time. And it's for someone who's actually worked in the field of public policy uh, in leadership in implementation, and we'd love for you to come and teach classes at both the Batten School, where I teach undergrad and students who are earning an MPP. So any student who's interested in the MPP, think about UVA. And for the last uh, four years, I've actually taught a class at the law school, uh, which focuses on education inside U.S. prisons. And so it was a blending of a joint appointment. Uh, and as you know, my wife is a professor at the University of Virginia. So for the first mm -hmm. time in the 20 years that we've been together, we're on the same schedule. So that's been great. Well, I'm, you know, I, I know you're raising two wonderful daughters, too. So that makes life much more <laughs> enjoyable and um, the ability to do raising the, the ability to raise two children um, when both parents are around and have similar schedules uh, is, is, uh, is really something to say. So my, my question, you know, the title of the show is Journeys of the Mind. I want to know about your journey. Um, you know, from what I remember, you were born or lived in Los Angeles, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, tell us about your life, you know, because I think in, in that way, we could begin to get uh, uh, the topic under discussion um, on board. Well, in many ways, I'm probably a very unlikely person to have become a university president. Let me tell you why. So you're right. I uh, grew up in uh, Los Angeles. You know, you've got roots in uh, the San Francisco area. And my parents were part of that post-World War II journey from the South to California in search of better economic and social opportunities. Uh, mother's from Louisiana, dad is from Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, I grew up with my stepfather uh, in my house who was from uh, uh, Marshall, Texas. And so we had three Southerners uh, in my life. And they were pretty clear, you know, work hard, uh, be kind, uh, you know, finish high school. And you do those things, we're in good shape. There was never a push for me to go to college or to graduate. Part of it was my parents could not afford to send me to college, even if they wanted to. Uh, but number two, you know, we come from a, uh, a blue collar home where people finished high school and went directly into work. And so I followed that initially working three years uh, union job uh, in Los Angeles. But lo and behold, I met uh, some good mentors of mine who said, listen, we think you have what it takes to finish college. I'm like, nah, not this kid. And so for those people who put their arms around me, I was at El Camino Community College and whether it was an Elaine Moore uh, or Mr. Roney uh, or Dr. Stewart or others, they said, we're gonna make it happen. And so between 1984 and 1987, I was a community college student in Los Angeles. Uh, I worked full time uh, unloading 18 wheeler trucks, cleaning meat rooms. And along the way, learning how to become a student for the first time. And so my journey through that taught me two things. Number one, where you start off in no way means that's going to be where you end up. And number two, the power of mentors. I mean, those people spoke truth into my life and saw a vision of Gerard or a version of Gerard that I didn't even see for myself. And so uh, they're very proud of me. You know, some of those people have passed since then. But that was my journey. And so it all started with mentors saying you could be more than you see. That's that's really wonderful. Well, what you know, after college, um, you know, you took several jobs and I'd like you to talk about them, you know, where you were the highest or close to the highest, well, the highest in one state and close to the highest in another state of education in the entire in an entire state. And I'd like you to talk about that a bit. 
So when I finished El Camino College, I uh, moved to the East Coast and studied philosophy at Howard University. Uh, when I graduated, I returned to Los Angeles and became a fifth grade school teacher. And I loved working with my students. And lo and behold, in uh, April of uh, 1992, a decision was rendered in the Rodney King case. And as you know, Los Angeles went up in flames. Well, to cut to the chase, that experience made me think very differently about how I could be involved in not only rebuilding my city, but in building confidence that there is an institution called government that we can use for good things. And then we, the people, just have to come together to make that happen. And so I ended up working in California state government uh, for a gentleman named uh, Bill Leonard, who was a state senator, fell in love with public policy, um, moved back east again, went to Harvard University, earned a master's degree where I studied ed policy. Policy. And then the ter type of jobs I had, I was executive director of a couple of nonprofits uh, that focused on education, one being the Black Alliance for Educational Options. Uh, from there, I had an opportunity to come to Virginia. Uh, for the second time, I was here before initially as a grad student, uh, but I worked for Governor Bob McDonald when he appointed me Secretary of Education for Virginia. And in that role, I had an opportunity to focus on policies for K-12 education, for community colleges, of course, which I'm a big fan of, as well as higher ed, and then went to uh, Florida to uh, work with Governor Rick Scott, uh, being his first uh, commissioner of education. So I had a chance at a high level to get involved in policy and politics, to become a sausage maker, so I know how that works. But having been an advocate and a school teacher, but really an advocate and nonprofit leader, I knew exactly how policies at the state level worked for nonprofits, worked for teachers and families, and how they did not. And so those experiences all played a role in me now, uh, finding myself in the classroom to prepare the next generation of people who want to use public policy, or at least the degree in public policy, to influence the public sector, the private sector, the military, uh, as well as uh, faith-based communities. Well, let me ask you a question specifically about education in Virginia. And, you know, most people involved in education, you know, uh, that have you know some knowledge of education, know that the Fairfax County schools in Virginia are, are often number one um, in the United States. So, you know, now these are public schools. And so, you know, we're not talking about um, the kind of private schools where I've taught, like Punahou School, where you visited to visit the Puello program. I'm gonna ask you about that in a bit. Um, but how do you explain this? How do you explain very good public schools, given the fact that they're always under sort of criticism in the press, uh, you know, often, you know? A great question. In fact, uh, Virginia was re uh, recently ranked number one in the country uh, for its K-12 system, as well as the importance of uh, the role higher ed plays. So you take a Fairfax County, which is uh, one of the largest in the state. Um, Thomas Jefferson uh, Magnet School is there, often the number one school in the country. There are three things that we know matter to make schools great. Number one are teachers who are working in uh, his or her field of expertise. We know that a teacher who's involved with that can actually raise a student's uh, grade or a competency level in math in reading uh, up to a year and a half or two years. That's number one. Uh, number two, resources matter, uh, both funding, uh, technology, access to partners in the community. So resources matter and money is surely one of them. Uh, and then the third thing is a strong principal, a strong leader, someone who sets the tone in the school that we're going to make this work well. Now, the assumption is because Fairfax County is also one of the wealthiest counties in the United States, being a suburb of uh, Washington, D.C., uh, we also have to brag about Virginia and the fact that we have a number of Title I schools. We have a number of schools that have 75 percent of more of their students are students of color who actually are Blue Ribbon Award winners. And these are uh, schools who win an award from the U.S. Department of Education for closing the achievement gap often at times outperforming some of their neighbors. And so while I say that poverty uh, has a long laundry list of liabilities, poverty is not a proxy for destiny. It tells you the challenges that you have, but we know from Title I schools, from Blue Ribbon schools, from inner city schools, and also rural schools that are doing well, that resources still matter, have to be used differently, teachers still matter, and the principal matters. I think the big difference there is the resource part, but it's also the expectation part. So I think Virginia's doing some great things, but yes, we still have pockets where we've got to close the gap. You know, um, what's interesting is the fact that you emphasize uh, the principal, and you've you've had the chance to 
talked to uh, Dr. Liz Hicks in Los Angeles and um, with the Gala School and all those girls, it's an all girls school. The girls wear uniforms, it's public. Kids come from all areas of Los Angeles, but generally the kids come from low income uh, families, meaning families that are challenged and resourced, it challenged because of their financial resources. But all these girls go on to college. And what's interesting about that is that it's um, also, uh, they also take you know three or four um, on average events, pl events placement classes. So everything you've just said seems to bear out with, a, with the gala school in uh, Los Angeles. Now, you work for someone who was you know, considered pretty conservative, um, Governor Scott in uh, Florida. And it seems like in your life, you've worked with you know, Democrats and Republicans, which is really a credit to you, especially in this time of divided, uh, divided you know, public policy. Um, what was your experience in Florida? And what was your experience with Governor Scott? And I must say, I must tell you the story. Um, every year I go back and I grade AP European history exams. And I was in um, Kansas City, Missouri, and I arrive early with the advanced uh, sort of administrative team. And the person who ran the limousine to come and get us to deliver us to our hotels happened to be Governor Scott's mother. And mm. she owned this limousine service and she happened to be driving one time and she kind of mildly said, oh, you, do you, you may have heard of my, my son, he's governor of Florida. And I said, yes, I've heard of your son. <laughs> anyway, but I'll, I'll let you answer the question now. So you know, what was it like? So Governor Rick Scott has a very similar story uh, to my own, and he talked about it when he ran for office. Um, he uh, grew up in a housing project. Uh, he, uh, did not, don't th he didn't know his initial dad, but he grew up with his stepdad. Uh, he was very poor, uh, had a tough time in school, uh, ultimately finished high school, uh, had a business mind and decided that he would go to a community college like I did as well and work his way through college. But along the way, he ended up purchasing um, a donut shop. And that one purchase led to other purchases, which led to him becoming a multimillionaire by one and, uh, running one of the largest uh, health networks in the country. Yes, people who will look it up will know some of the controversy that was surrounding some of that. But he used that business acumen to not only make himself uh, important in the conversations about health care and policy, but also to employ thousands of people. And so one day he said, well, if a poor kid like me who grew up without all the uh, amenities that many people in the Fairfax would just use that as an example, or here or even in Charlottesville, how can I do it and they can't? And what can we take from the private sector and bring into the public sector? And so he used that mindset to kind of shape what we would do in education, including adding an additional billion dollars to K-12 education uh, in Florida, uh, including making, making some major changes to math and reading scores, but more importantly, also his focus on students with special needs. You know, we changed our laws in the state. So it was great to work for him. Uh, working for a conservative comes with a, a number of challenges because the assumption is if you're conservative, it's because you have no heart or because you don't care about people, or you only want to help rich, rich people. And so uh, I enjoyed working with that. He's now, of course, you know, in the U.S. Senate, and, and we're still in contact periodically. But I enjoyed working for him and equally enjoyed working for Governor uh, Bob McDonald in Virginia, because had there been no Governor Bob McDonald, there wouldn't have been a Governor Rick Scott to work for him. Well, you know, let's let's talk about, you know, um, conservatives and education. You know, um, you and I have been to the, you know, the National uh, Private Leadership Conference, which is sponsored by the DOE, but consists of mostly, you know, private educational schools, not independent schools, but like schools of religion, homeschoolers, et cetera. So how do you think about um, the whole issue of vouchers? Um, because I don't think that we've ever had a full discussion in the United States about vouchers and how they can be helpful and um, and, you know, we, we've had discussions about, you know, uh, like Edison, uh, the Edison company coming in and taking over schools, which seems to be, you know, not very controversial at times, um, but vouchers seem to some, somehow become very controversial when perhaps with your expertise, we can, you know, discover something more sort of neutral about this, this whole, because uh, maybe you can have you know, public education and vouchers. But anyway, I'll leave it to you because you're the expert. No, great question. So if you ever want to lose friends, tell them you support vouchers. <laughs> Charters are bad, but if you really want to lose friends, tell them about vouchers. So let me just state up front, I'm a supporter of public money uh, being used or invested into the private sector schools, whether they're religious or otherwise. And what I remind people is that long before you had the creation of the first what we call voucher program in the United States, which started in Milwaukee uh, in the early 1990s, 
which was championed by an African-American Democrat uh, named Polly Williams. Uh, in many ways, she was the Rosa Parks of the parental choice movement in modern times. And she's the one who said, listen, public schools in Milwaukee are working for some of our students. Magnet schools are working for some of our students. Busing is working for some of our students. But some of our students need a different type of education, one that's a private education, independent. Most people are unaware that for the first several years, the voucher schools or the private schools in Milwaukee were all non-religious schools. The addition of religious schools uh, uh, came later. And so I tell people, if you want to know if it works or not, look at the research of Dr. Patrick Wolf, who's a scholar at the University of Arkansas. Uh, they have a center focused on school choice. He's one of the top 10 scholars in the nation, focused on education writ large, I'd say probably number one or two for school choice. And his research has shown a few things. Number one, on an apples to apples comparison, students who applied for a voucher and did not receive it, and students who applied and received it, when they followed their math and test scores across time, there were at least seven gold standard studies which show the students that uh, performed well. But guess what? There are actually three sh uh, studies which show they uh, were underperformed or their peers outperformed them. But if you look at 11 and three, you know, and you're playing football, you'll be in a bowl game. But only in education politics is that still considered a loss. I said, wait a minute, three and 11. So it's a political thing. That's number one. But I also have to remind people that before 1990, with the passage of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965, signed by President Johnson, who is still the only American president to earn a degree in education, we've had Title I money going to Catholic schools for decades. We've had Title II funds go to private schools, religious schools for decades, because we simply see private schools and the public funding of it as a part of a national vision to make sure that we support the general welfare by supporting all students. We get to the debate about separation of church and state. First of all, it's nowhere mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, some of that language is found in an 182 letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to a group of Danbury Baptists uh, in Connecticut. But even if you go Further than that, we also find it in some philosophical aspects. And so the separation of church and state uh, we use when we choose to use it. But be very clear, private universities are taking Pell Grants like Georgetown, like Catholic University. Religious schools are taking them all the time. But somehow when it's K-12, it's a problem. I'll be the first to tell you, we have some shysters in the voucher school movement. They're only in it for money. Those kind of people should be outed, their schools should be closed, and we should acknowledge it. So we have bad actors in here, but that is no reason for me not to support vouchers. I support it because I support what I would call a 360 view of giving families an opportunity. Well, just to be fair, we have to remember the, scare, the scandal in Atlanta in public schools where people were all to altering scores in the public yeah. sector, which wasn't so great either. So. Um, let me ask you this question, because you have done public policy, not only in education, but in prison reform. And again, you've done it on a bipartisan basis. And um, interestingly enough, I think his at, name is Adam Gopnik, um, just wrote a piece in the New Yorker, this last New Yorker, about prison reform. And I was surprised, you would probably not be surprised, that you know one of the names he mentioned at first was Angela Davis. Now, you know, uh, you know, when I think of Angela Davis, I think of sort of really radical um, uh, sort of political point of view. Um, but from this article, it seems sort of reasonable. And a lot of people in the in the prison reform movement, um, you know, have various positions. But how do you see this link between educational reform and prison reform? And I, I mentioned Angela Davis for one reason only, and that is that it seems like people from the left and from the right can come into both these issues and make some progress. And people seem to have kind of similar views on all of this. You know, I mean, they may not, people may not adopt a radical position of someone from the left or from the right, but they seem to want reform. When I speak to audiences at universities um, or at conferences or even before private sector, uh, groups. And you say, how many people in here 
uh, know of someone who graduated from college. A lot of hands will go up because a lot of people are from college. How many people know of someone who likes ice cream? Great. And then I'll say, how many people in here know someone who's been impacted by the criminal justice system? And all of a sudden, there are a number of hands that will go in the air. But what shocks people most is you will look over and say, oh, I didn't know so-and-so had someone who was criminally involved or impacted by the system. They're wealthy. They're the CEO of the company. Why would that happen to them? This stuff only happens to poor people or people of color or people. And so you realize when you have over 70 people in the United States with a criminal record, when you have over 13,000 laws on the books that prohibit or create a barrier for people after leaving prison to enter certain jobs, when you have one out of approximately 14 children in the United States who at one point have a parent who's incarcerated. And as you and I are speaking right now, over 2 million children did not hear good morning from a mom or dad because of incarceration. Incarceration impacts a lot of people. So it's one of the few issues that goes across race, class, gender, income, region, or religion. And so all of a sudden you say, hey, we've got to figure out how to make this work. And so when you have a new Gingrich on the right, who's going to partner with, at that time, he was alive, former uh, uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings from Baltimore, after the death of, or the killing of 30 Gray in Baltimore, when these two decide to get together and say, what can we do to bring some justice to what we see in the streets? Then all of a sudden, people will say, well, if the right is for this, whether it's the Charles Koch Foundation, Right on Crime, Prison Fellowship, the NAACP, the National Urban League, the ACLU, who on any other issue, school choice being an example, total opposite. But now we're talking about criminal justice reform because so many people are impacted. And this is what keeps me hopeful because I said, if we can do it for criminal justice reform, we can do it for education. The same education we're trying to give people in prison, realize a lot of people in some states, over 50% of the people who are there have challenges with literacy, never finished high school, or if they finished high school, it was a diploma mill, and they really don't have the skill set. And so I'm excited about the work. I've been doing it, you know, 15 plus years now, really going back to my time when I was at Howard University. But criminal justice reform is an example that we can put down the R, put down the D, put down the I, put down whatever else, and say, let's focus on one thing second chances or better chances. And so I've been glad to be a part of a coalition of people on the right of left, because at the end of the day, people, families who are impacted and victims too, I'm very clear about that. They're interested in what can we do to have safe streets, uh, to bring justice, and to make sure that the people who are leaving prisons come to our community in better shape. And in some instances, places like Georgia, a right state, was leading the policy discussion on this, particularly when Nathan Deal was in office, or a place like Texas, which at one point led the nation, uh, was one of the nation's leaders in private prisons, have since then closed seven prisons. And so there's a lot of lessons uh, we can learn from the right of center states. So you outlined um, very succinctly um, in terms of education reform, you know, having a good principal and having, be, having, you know, having a school being resourced. I mean, those were two key issues. So if you were to point to prisons, or their lack of, because in this article in the New Yorker, you know, there were some people who said, you know, that there should be no prisons. What would you advocate um, as an expert in this field for um, for uh, prison reform? I mean, are there, are there one, two, three um, aspects that you really would focus on? When you mention Angela Davis, what comes to mind for me is, A, she's got a PhD in philosophy. And so as someone who studied philosophy, I, I remember that she also went to UCLA. Um, she wrote a book titled, Are Prisons Obsolete? And she is one of the founding members of the prison abolition movement. I'm very clear, I'm not an abolitionist, I'm a reformer. I'm someone who believes there is a role for the prison in the United States. But more importantly, what we often talk about with prison is really about incapacitation, meaning you can punish someone by, by making them incapacitated in places other than prison. Some people have drug problems send them to a drug treatment center. Some people have mental health problems. Incapacitation can play, take place inside of a hospital. So I'm not for the abolition of prisons, but you know what? On the first day of class, for the class I teach at the law school and at the Batten school, I have two articles in there written by abolitionists. 
And a couple of students said, well, if you're a reformer, why are you talking about abolition? I said, because I'm a professor. I want you to see the totality of thought as it relates to this. So that's Angela Davis. To answer your question, number one is to support the current Pell Grant program in prisons. Um, this coming September will be the uh, second year since 1994 that incarcerated people have access to a Pell Grant. Uh, over 40,000 people from 2015 to the present uh, matriculated through that process. And if uh, President Obama, and he's got several feathers they can put in his hat, one of his hat, uh, one feather, is he's the first sitting American president to ever visit a federal prison. And it was that experience that opened up a whole second chance initiative. So Pell Grants, number one. Number two, continue to support through funding and through good uh, instruction, including online, access to adult basic education and adult secondary education. Most of the people who are pursuing an education in prison are going for elementary, middle, and high school degrees. So we've got to focus on that. I like the college, but that's a small but important segment. So focus on that. Number two, I'm all about jobs. Now, I get in trouble when I tell uh, friends of mine, if your child decides to finish high school, and if he or she decides not to go to college, it's not the end of the world. You want to know why? We now have certificate programs at the high school level where a student can finish with a high school diploma in one hand and a certificate or licensure or something. And they're going to earn a heck of a lot more than my teachers are going to earn when they come out of school. And they're going to do it from day one. So I'm saying let's push trades and jobs that work. Uh, the third thing I would do is to say that we have to do a better job of working with women who are incarcerated. Now, why women only make up 7% of the prison population uh, right now, there's been over an 800% increase in the number of women who are going to prison since 1970. 52% of the women who are in prison are moms. From certain communities, when you lock up the mom, you've just locked out the family from economic opportunity. And so we've got to find ways of meeting women uh, in prison, not only where they are, but not also assigning gender or sex role type jobs for them. They want to weld, they should weld. They want to go into computer science, yeah, jobs we think are for men. That's not Gerard saying that, that's women who've spoken to my students or spoken to my events who said they're trying to genderize us into certain professions. So I'd say we need to open that up. I think the third thing or the last thing we need to do is to look for international examples. Now, as you know, I've had a chance in the last year to travel to Germany, uh, to Norway and Brazil. I did this with support from the Aero Center for Justice, uh, which is headquartered here in Northern Virginia. Uh, Arthur Reiser, Jesse Reiser, our husband and wife duo, both Army, uh, 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 people who are Army uh, uh, personnel. And they said, if we want to figure out what to do, we've got great lessons in the United States, but I've traveled with them. And so I'm writing uh, op-eds and, and other things to talk about international lessons. Because remember, when the United States penitentiary was created uh, back in the late 1790s and really matured in the 1820s. From the 1820s moving forward, there were international conferences, one held here in the United States where people would come together to talk about prisons, what's working and what's not. So I would say um, that's another thing that we can do as well. Of course, I'm always biased for policy, but that's that's a given. Well, you know, one of the things that you seem to emphasize is the role of education. Um, in prisons, both the Pell Grants, also in, in continuing education, um, and also alternative um, places for people who have drug problems or who have mental mental um, problems, um, you know, people who have psychiatric problems, you know, the, perhaps prison um, is not the best place for either of those categories, which would greatly reduce the prison population and may produce um, things that are, um, you know, the outcomes might be much better. My, my last question, running towards the end of the show, uh, which mm -hmm. is about a half an hour, um, my, my, my last question for you is a personal one, because um, when I first, uh, I, as I mentioned, we met at that conference in Washington, D.C., but you were so kind to, to invite me to another uh, conference, which seemed to be highly represented by historically Black colleges. And of course, this is the first time I knew that you went to Howard. You know, I knew that you went to Harvard. And I knew about El Camino, but I did not know about Howard. And so what was your role in that organization? And did you play a role in helping? And it's interesting that both the Democrats and the Republicans in this presidential race are talking about historically black colleges. And of course, one of the 
candidates uh, graduated from a historically black college. So that makes it even more um, enduring and more important. The meeting that you were so kind to attend uh, was uh, supported by the uh, Center for Advancing Opportunity, CAO. And that organization was funded uh, by the Charles Koch Institute, the Charles Koch Foundation, in a partnership with the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. And part of what we did for three consecutive years is invited more than 200 people from across the country, left, right, middle, HBCU and non-HBCU to come together to talk about economic mobility, uh, criminal justice reform and education. But we anchor the conversation in the role that scholars and students at HBCUs could play. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, one former HBCU president is a gentleman named Dr. Samuel Proctor. Now, people from the East Coast may know him because he was the uh, pastor for a number of years of Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York City, uh, where Adam Clayton Powell at one point was pastor. And Dr. Proctor and I had an opportunity to work together to uh, um, work on an education project. And a very wealthy lady uh, asked him one time, why do we need the Black college today? We have so many non-HBCUs where Black students could go. I understood during segregation, that's the only place you can go. Why you need a Howard when you have a Harvard? And he sat in his seat knowing this was, of course, not the first time he heard the question. And he said, let me change the question. The question isn't, do we need the Black college? The question is, where would America be without the Black college? Without the HBCU, you wouldn't have American democracy as we know it today. And so as we're talking about HBCUs and as an alum, uh, we see them as a part of a higher education uh, template that's simply saying it's like other things, it's one opportunity. Although we make up only 3% of all the higher education institutions, we produce over a quarter of the engineers, doctors, dentists, uh, over a third of the teachers. And again, without HBCUs, America will look very, very different. And so that conference was a part of the role of the HBCU. This presidential election, it's a big part of it. But the work that you were doing um, at Pueyo, uh, at your school, in many ways was almost an HBCU mission, taking students of color, who often aren't given an opportunity, bringing them to an institution uh, with a lot of resources, uh, human and otherwise, and saying, look what we can do to create a new pathway for you to move forward. In many ways, when you're talking about education, this is a really story that really has its origins going all the way back to uh, ancient times, using education from the Latin word ajuco to bring from darkness into light. And I've been doing that in my career in both K-12 higher ed and prisons. Well, that is a good way to end, but I want to uh, conclude with one more, one last question, and that is, you know, when we started Pueo and Kahi at Ilani, both schools you visited, um, the, the purpose of the program was to take kids who were on free or reduced lunch, but in the great middle academically, and, you know, make sure that they went to college. But it was a private school, public school partnership, both at Ilani and at Punahou and other schools now in Hawaii. My question is, why don't you think that's kind of caught on across the United States? Because, you know, it, going back to your hometown, uh, Los Angeles, Harvard Westlake has so much money. It's so well endowed. Or you go to San Francisco, uh, where I spent most of my college years, Lowell High School that has, you know, everyone goes to, you know, Berkeley is their safe school there. Oh, just really <laughs> saying something, you know, but, um, you know, why do you think that hasn't caught on? And it seems like a fairly... Um, good thing to do when you can get a lot of things going in that um, um, in that sort of degree. And, you know, I, I have to mention Betsy DeVos, too, because even though she's a conservative and there's many criticisms of her that probably are valid, you know, she was big on, you know, vouchers and big on sort of coming together of private schools and public schools. But I'm just curious, it doesn't seem, I mean, there, there are pockets of it across the country, but it seems like a natural thing, especially with the huge success of Catholic schools across the United States. Well, I think one is just um, mistrust that if a public school decides to go to a private school, are they going to, when the students see the resources there, they're going to come back to their school and say, wow, why is our school so under-resourced? Or I'm getting a better education at the private school in five weeks compared to the public school. I think there's just a not mistrust, a misunderstanding. I think that a good private school principal and a good public school principal should grab lunch, breakfast or something, and say, 
um, before the end of school, let's bring 20 of your students to my school and let them spend a week there. And we're gonna send 20 of our students to your school. It's simply an exchange. It's not to say who's better or worse. It's to simply say, what kind of experiences are we getting by walking in different shoes? So I think one of it is the leadership issue. I think there's some misunderstanding. Um, third, in terms of just the whole idea about public-private, I just don't think we give enough credence to the great public schools that we have because there are private schools that can benefit from going to a public school. And so mm -hmm. I think it's also got to be the other way around, but that's a leadership thing the principals can do. And maybe with you asking that question, uh, you and I can uh, start a conversation more uh, about doing that. That sounds great. And, you know, um, again, um, uh, P Professor Gerard Robinson at the University of Virginia, what a pleasure it is to see you. Ahui ho, and thank you, and aloha, uh, Professor Robinson. Aloha.